Whew, there's a bit of chill in the air, Megan. I know. And that means that you're probably getting ready to fire up your furnace for the cold months ahead. It's time to get ready for the winter hibernation. That's right. Today we'll get your furnace tuned up and we'll make sure you're ready to turn on the heat. Then we'll show you how to light your house for the holidays that will keep you safe and use less energy. And cooking takes a lot of energy. We'll show you how you can still cook a great meal without heating up the whole house. Tis the season to give, so why not choose gifts that save some energy? We'll spread some holiday cheer next on Powerhouse. What's that smell? It's getting cold, so I turned on the furnace. Oh, that's what I'm smelling. You know, that reminds me. I probably should get a tune-up to make sure it's ready for the season. I'll make a call. All right. Meet PJ Kalb. He's a heating expert and performs thousands of maintenance checks on heating equipment each year. A tune-up helps keep your furnace in tip-top shape. Okay, PJ, so Pete turned the furnace on and there was this nasty smell coming out and that's why we called you for the tune-up. Can you explain what that is? What that most likely was is over the summer months you'll get dirt and some lint and some things that build up on the heat exchanger. When this appliance is first turned on in the fall that has to burn off and usually that's what it is. It's just a kind of a burnt dust smell. Yes exactly and it's safe right when that Absolutely. happens? Absolutely. Okay. Why is it important to have your furnace tuned up? It's really important to have this tuned up. I compare it to your automobile. If you don't maintain and take care of it, it's not gonna last as long as it should, and it's the same with this type of an appliance. If it's not maintained and taken care of, it's not gonna last as long as it should, and it's not gonna run as efficiently as it should. There's a lot of moving parts to a furnace. Uh, I brought some of them with me just to show you some of the things that we would do when we come to do an inspection. This happens to be an uh, igniter on a furnace. This tip here turns bright orange and that's what lights your appliance. And that comes on every time your furnace comes on. This actually heats up and is what starts your furnace. So this is real important and is also a part that fails quite often too. So when we come out to do an inspection, we can take some tests on this and visually look at this and tell the life expectancy of it and whether it's working properly. If it's not, that's what we call preventive maintenance. We can change things that we know are going to be going out maybe in a month or two and make that uh, work more efficiently. It looks like it's detachable, so it's not like you'd have to replace your whole furnace if something like this went wrong. It's something that you could just modify there on the spot. Correct, and replace sure the part. And this is something our service technicians carry frequently. There's also flame sensors in your furnace. This steel rod here actually heats up. When that furnace lights, it has to get this rod so hot within less than two seconds. And with a lot of furnaces that are in a laundry room in a basement, uh, in a utility room, they'll get a lot of contaminants that'll come into that furnace and they'll collect on this rod and kind of coat that insulated a little bit and cause that to, to uh, have nuisance failures and it'll be on and off and do some things like that. So we can inspect that, clean that, also test that. It's porcelain, so if that's cracked or things like that. We, we can visually look at that and know whether we need to change that. I brought a couple other things with me too. This is a burner out of a furnace and uh, on a lot of heat exchangers over time they'll end up rusting and that rust will break down and fall on top of the burners and this happens to be a ribbon type burner and when that builds up on top of this it'll cause incomplete burn which can cause the furnace to soot. It can cause the gas to spill out the front and, and cause damage to the wiring and stuff. So it's really important to have that maintained and have this cleaned. These burners are designed where we can take them out and we can take them outside and blow them out with a compressor and make sure we get all the dust and contaminants out of those. You know, PJ, on Powerhouse, we always promote people changing their furnace filters or at least checking them monthly. And can you explain to us why that's so important? Well, I brought this with me and this happens to be a cell out of a furnace. A furnace has three, four, five cells depending on the size of the furnace. And what this is, is that the burner goes in this port down here. Your gas has come through this. It heats this up. That's what heats your house. And when that furnace filter is not maintained, that kind of creates a blanket 
which blocks that and doesn't allow that air to come through when that blower is trying to pull air across this heat exchanger, which causes this heat exchanger to get hotter and hotter. And after so many times of that happening, it'll end up cracking. And that's what we talk about when we talk about a cracked heat exchanger. And what happens with these cracks is when that gets hot, they actually open up, which allows the uh, carbon monoxide and gases to escape into the ductwork, which goes through your house, which is a, an unsafe condition. It's really important to, to maintain the uh, uh, filter on that furnace as a homeowner. That's the one thing that we uh, really stress is that they change that filter monthly. If it's a, a decent pleated filter, they might be able to go every two months. But I tell people to, to just have a marker down by the furnace and put a date on it. Then you know when you changed it. So a lot of these things that you're checking for are not simply for comfort. They really are for safety. Correct. So what else do you do in your inspection? Uh, one of the big things we do is we uh, shut the blower off and disconnect the blower. And that way when we run the furnace, we can allow that furnace to overheat. And we can check a lot of flame rollouts, uh, limit switches, uh, different components inside that furnace that are designed for safety that we can make sure that they're operating the way they're supposed to be. It sounds like you accomplish an awful lot in this time. How long does it take? It takes around 45 minutes to an hour to do an inspection. And people should do it annually, did you say? We recommend that you have it done yearly, yes. Okay. It's nice to have that peace of mind, having that checked at your convenience, as opposed to it breaking down at 2 o'clock in the morning or when you're out of town or something like that. For the 80 or $90 that it costs to have this maintenance done to it, you can pay that off within a heating season. Absolutely. Thanks so much, PJ. Thank you. Okay. When you turn on your furnace for the first time each season, it's always a good idea to double check your carbon monoxide detectors and replace the batteries. Just touch the test button on the detector, okay, and make sure it's working properly. If you don't have a CO detector, make sure you buy one and place them in your home by the sleeping and living areas. CO detectors range in price and style, but you can find basic detectors for as low as $25. Let's plug it in. You may know that we're really big fans of LED light bulbs. We've shown you how they save money over regular light bulbs, but you can also see the savings when you take a look at holiday lighting. Now this is a standard electric meter. I've plugged in a few strings of older C9 bulbs. That's the larger holiday light that we're all familiar with. Now, 50 of these bulbs would cost about $5.93 to light for five hours a day for 30 days. Now, $5 and change may not seem like much, but when you light up the same number of LED bulbs, you'll see the meter slows down. This will only cost you about 16 cents for that same five hours a day for 30 days. That's an example of only a few strings of light bulbs. What if you wanted to decorate your entire home? Well, Pete's gonna show you how. Meet Aaron Kleppe. Aaron is an expert in outdoor home lighting. He gets extremely busy as it starts to turn cold, as he helps people light their homes for the holidays. Aaron, it's getting chilly outside. Must be holiday lighting time. Let's talk a little bit about what you're doing this morning. Absolutely. We're doing a real classic design with warm white C7 bulbs. I would say the C7 bulb is probably the most widely used bulb on the average home. Now, if your home sits further away from the street and, and you want to create more light for the folks to enjoy it, then you're probably going to want to use a C9 bulb, which is a, a little larger bulb yeah. uh, that puts out a little more light. But the C7, that's what you have going on C7 back here. is what we're using here. Ex explain a little bit of what you're doing for this, this house and you the homeowner bet. here. You bet. I mean, the homeowner has landscape lighting. So what I like to do in this situation is incorporate my holiday lighting into the landscape lighting and have them blend and work together to hopefully create a really neat atmosphere. Oh, that's neat, that's neat. So how many feet of lights are you putting on this house? Sure, this home we have over 200 foot of, of light, uh, one C7 bulb per foot. And your bulbs, you're using LEDs. Talk to us about the benefits of LEDs. Absolutely, I only use LEDs. There are so many benefits to LED versus incandescent. You have energy savings, you have less heat. If you have one go out, the entire string doesn't go out. You have durability. 
Uh, LED lights last far longer than an incandescent light does. Okay. Talk just a little about uh, the, the cost savings with, with LED. Sure. Most folks run their uh, holiday lighting probably the day after Thanksgiving. It seems like that's the date that everybody wants to be able to flip that switch. And you're gonna run that until probably the second or third of January in most cases. This house with approximately 200 lights, one light per foot in that time period with LED, $15 worth of electricity used. Now the old incandescent bulbs would have been $150 for that same time period. Wow. Wow. And if you figure that over a five-year span, that's significant a, that's savings. Aaron, let's talk a little bit about uh, new ideas in terms of lighting for the holidays. Every year, the lighting tends to get better, and there's more and more ideas out there. Uh, it seems like incorporating landscape lighting with your holiday lighting and blending them all together, I think that's the, the largest trend. Another trend would be outlining driveways and sidewalks and entryways, stoops with stake lighting. So it's the exact same lighting that you have on the roof. The only difference is you have a stake every foot that you're putting the bulbs onto. And how about colors? Where do colors come into play? You're starting to see more and more color. You know, here we're doing the classic look. I can think of a house off the top of my head. We started on this project last year and we're, we're just gonna keep building on it every year. It's a blue house, two-story house, so it's very tall. Uh, we're doing bright, bright lights on the top and then uh, some purplish, bluish up lighting. It, it almost looks like Disney. <laughs> do, you, do you have to uh, consult clients in terms of not, to, and I, I refer to being too Griswoldy and getting carried away? You do. The goal is to work together and find a happy medium for everybody. As, as you help people think about holiday lighting, what's one of the first things that you talk to them about uh, when it comes to lighting their, lighting their homes? First and foremost, safety, Pete. If there's any way you can put these lights up in October rather than November, uh, I think you're going to be much safer. You're not going to have to deal with frost on the roof, ice in the gutters, and ice on your ladder, which taking the first step off of a roof onto an icy ladder is not the way to do it. Well, Aaron, the holiday lights, it's always a festive time, and it's neat to see when you bring your expertise to putting lights up there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pete, for having me. When it's holiday time, food is a part of most every gathering, which means that your kitchen will be hopping and your appliances will be using a lot of energy. Meet Nina Swan Kohler. She's a home economist, nutritionist, culinary professional, cookbook author, and a cooking school director. In short, she knows her way around the kitchen. Nina, I love to cook, and I am so excited to be in this beautiful kitchen today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for coming. I'm glad to have you here. Now, you have years of experience of prepping and cooking for many, many people, and that takes a lot of energy, right? Yes, a lot of personal energy. There you go. <laughs> now, during the holidays, is it possible to save personal energy and electrical energy Absolutely. by cooking efficiently. Absolutely. Ideally, you need to have appliances that are Energy Star certified to be the most efficient that are available on the market. That's the first thing. If you had to pick one appliance that you use during the holidays more than another, what would that be? I would say the convection oven. And you know, a lot of people don't even know what a convection oven is, or what the advantages are of a convection oven. And actually, one of the ways that you can tell is it actually has a fan in the back of the oven that circulates the hot air so that it's going to bake more efficiently, um, more even browning, but also it's going to allow us to bake more than one item at a time. Another good thing is to purchase the ones that are self-cleaning. Those are going to be much more energy efficient because they're, they're built to hold in the extra high heat for, to clean them, and so they're gonna work much more efficiently too. I've gone ahead and prepared some of my favorite uh, Thanksgiving meals to have. One is sweet potatoes. I just put a little butter and brown sugar and pecans on mine. We'll place those in the oven and also Thanksgiving dressing that has herbs. We'll place those in the oven at the same time. Now, that is one nice thing about a convection oven. Because of that circulating air, there aren't hot spots like you right. might find in a traditional oven. Right. So you can utilize all the space and all the racks. You can. Walls. Maybe the 
the dressing takes a little longer to bake than the sweet potatoes. So you could put the dressing in first, then 10 minutes later add the, the sweet potatoes. The rolls need to be heated up for the, about the last 10 minutes. So we can just simply add those to the same oven and you've been very efficient to actually bake three different items. You might even add some cookies on top if you want. Now you know what, efficiency is a good point. From the way you were just describing that, a lot of saving energy is planning ahead. It is. Planning is so important. So if you can plan to not have to keep turning it off and turning it back on because that uses a lot of excess energy. Great. Okay, now I see you also have a lot of small appliances laid out. Let's take a look at how you use those. Absolutely. Uh, one of the first things that I'd like, like to talk about is the slow cookers. They come in a variety of sizes. Most people have them. They're really good for heating up dips or heating up soups, um, even making main dishes and uses less energy than cooking it on a cooktop. Another one is a deep fat fryer. Um, it's much better to use an electric deep fat fryer because you can maintain a consistent heat, which is hard to do on a cooktop, so that's really good and it uses less energy. Another one is to use a hot plate, like if you're serving appetizers or foods on a buffet type thing, this keeps you from getting in and out of the oven and keeps the foods hot. But also the microwave isn't really a small appliance, but a microwave oven really is an incredible tool as well. Um, so many times people just think of the microwave as a tool to heat up um, leftovers or whatever, but it's really good as an energy saver to start cooking in the microwave. Okay, speaking of cooking, baking, what kind of cookware do you prefer when it comes to baking? Do you like glass or do you like metal? I like glass or ceramic. You can actually reduce the temperature in the oven by about 25 degrees and still maintain a really good heat conduction and baking faster. So I definitely recommend the ceramic or the glass. It looks prettier too in my it opinion. It does, much better for a holiday. Yeah. Now let's talk about pots and pans okay. too. And what do you prefer and what should we look for? Well, the main thing is um, the weight of the pan, but also um, you wanna match size for size. This one matches almost exactly to the burner size. That's very important to get the proper conduction. By putting a lid on either of the pans, that's gonna hold in um, the heat as well and take less energy to actually cook the food. Now, if you have copper cookware, that's the best. That's gonna conduct the energy even better. But the main thing is the heaviness and a flat surface that really connects. Okay, well, we've talked so far about things that we use to cook, right? Things that we cook right. with. Are there ways to save energy in preparation? Absolutely. Right behind you, I've prepared a tray. We call this mise en place, actually preparing all of the ingredients, prepping them, chopping the carrots, uh, cutting the zucchini and julienne strips. Having everything ready before you start cooking is actually going to save energy uh, when you do cook. So that's a good thing to do. Plus the fact that you'll know you have all the ingredients gathered. So many times we forget get an ingredient. Um, we may not have it in the house, so we have to stop everything and run to the store and get that. So this is a good technique to use to help in preparation. This is a great point. Do you have any other tips or trade secrets you'd like to share with us? Well, some other things. We've been talking about heating using cooking uh, tools, but we also need to think about serving foods that are cold. My favorite is a cranberry salad, uh, cheese plates, cold dips, and that kind of thing. They help fill in the hot dishes for a holiday meal, so keep that in mind as a way to save energy. And also with drinks, having a drink center that people can go to and help themselves. We don't want them to get in and out of the refrigerator because that's gonna release energy as well. So if we can kind of create our own little drink center where we can maybe have a couple of different spritzers or little punch drinks that we can serve, it's a great way to make people feel welcome when they come to your home. Well, we have felt welcome in your home today. Thank, Thank you. So so much for this information. Thank you. Now can we eat everything? Yes, of course. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, Pete, it wouldn't be the holidays without gift giving. You bet, Megan. And we have some great ideas for gifts that save energy. We do. Now, let's start with a smart thermostat. There are many options of smart thermostats at the store and you can pick one up for, what, around $200 or so? Now they know when you're home and they also help control your heating and cooling costs without you thinking about it. The savings is pretty great too. They can help you save between seven to 15% on your energy costs. That's great. Everything is getting smart. How about this smart light switch? 
If you don't want to spend money on smart light bulbs, just buy a smart switch. This will control the lights in any given room all from your phone. It runs about $20 and some options are voice activated. Now we talk a lot about phantom energy and these devices are gonna help keep that in check for you. Phantom energy is the power used by TVs, phone chargers and computers, even when you're not using them. Now, this is called a smart socket and this is a smart power strip. And both of these are able to be controlled by your phone or by voice assistant. You just plug the appliance in that you wanna control in here, and if you opt to use the app, you can actually see the energy that it's using. Ooh, I like that. And let's not forget about the sun. This is a solar powered phone charger. Instead of plugging your phone into a wall outlet to charge up, just leave this little gem in the sun all day and then plug in your phone to charge without using electricity from your wall outlet. No more phantom power from your phone charger when using this gift. You know what? That's what you can get me. That is a great gift. And I'll get you and we'll both act surprised. There we go. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of gifts, we learned a lot today. We really did. Now that the cold weather is here, it means it's time to get your heating equipment tuned up. You'll keep it running efficiently and make sure it's not leaking any carbon monoxide. That's right. And we just can't get enough of LED lights. The energy use for holiday lighting can really add up. But if you switch to LED lighting, you'll not only save money, but you'll also continue to have a bright holiday display. And my favorite part is the food. So if you plan on cooking up a storm in the kitchen this year, remember you can make small adjustments that can really add up to savings. Using the right equipment for the right task will bring down that kitchen energy usage and your bank account will thank you for it. That's right. And as we just said, give the gift of energy savings this year. From smart thermostats to power strips, light switches, and those solar phone chargers, you can take control of the energy you're using around your home. And that'll make your house a very festive powerhouse.